I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the bits where you do driving in non-driving video games are usually any good. Quite the opposite, in fact. You went right off the scanners, Commander. Now we have to bring you back. Thank you, Mass Effect. That being said, there are a few vehicle sections in games that somehow are actually fun, satisfying, and which don't retroactively ruin the entire game for you. Can we stop showing the Mako, please? Thanks. Here are seven vehicle sections in non-driving video games that are actually better than most driving games. Something I can state with absolute confidence because Mike is off this week. Enjoy. A vehicle section in Yakuza 0, you might be thinking. Oh, and you must be talking about the bit where you're driving down the freeway shooting a gun out of the window at cars. To which I reply, are you high? That's clearly the worst bit of the entire game. No, the vehicles I'm talking about are much smaller, speedier, and liable to flying off the track and landing in someone's lunch. I'm talking about Pocket Circuit Racing, the children's toy car game that hardened Yakuza enforcer Kiryu Kazuma gets way, way too into in Yakuza 0 and Yakuza Kiwami. Despite the fact that the Pocket Circuit Center is run by a man in a bright tracksuit who calls himself the Pocket Circuit Fighter, and that all his opponents are children, Kiryu dedicates himself to the sport of slot car racing with the single-minded focus that he devotes to, well, everything. And if you go along with this, you can follow the questline all the way from being a rookie racer to the champion of Camarocho. The key to Pocket Circuit is balancing your speed with your grip. The faster you go, the better, and you can boost to go all out, but go too fast and you'll send your car flying clear off the track. <laughs> the tracks are also dotted with little ramps that make rapid, unscheduled car takeoff much more likely, so you'll need to learn where the best spots are for slowing down, as well as when to gun it, for example when you need enough speed to make it round a loop-de-loop. <laughs> As a result, Pocket Circuit races are blisteringly fast, tense affairs, and nothing in the game beats the sense of achievement you get when you crush your opponents, even if they are grade school children. <laughs> the real appeal of Pocket Circuit lies in the customization, though. There really is a breathtaking array of options for you to swap out and fiddle with, from the tires and the frame to the motor, battery, and suspension, and each component will affect things such as the car's speed, balance, acceleration, and grip. Important if you're trying to stay on the track. Different, special, and unique components can be found all over the place throughout the game, from shops to more shady, illicit places, and you'll really need to scour Camarocho if you're going to create the ultimate slot car to crush those dumb kids trying to enjoy themselves. Hmm. Yeah, in your face, kids! Alright, back to the drudgery of my day job fighting my way to the top of Tokyo's organised crime syndicates, I guess. <laughs> Listen, as nice as it's been to catch up with you, I really got to take this call, so... Well, Nate, one more thing. Nate! What? You, uh, you do realize that your phones are equipped with GPS, right? I'll see you soon, buddy. The thing about video games dedicated to driving cars and nothing else is that they almost never celebrate the Hollywood stunt-style spectacle of fast vehicles smashing into other fast vehicles. Props, as ever, to notable exception Burnout 3, our lord and saviour. On the other hand, and more typically, when I side-slam my racing nemesis in F1 2020, no one is impressed. See? This is when I turn to the Uncharted series to bring me the kind of breathless, reckless, destructive white-knuckle car chase that would make the underwriter of James Bond's car insurance sweat through their shirt. Nowhere does Naughty Dog blockbuster production value collide with Nathan Drake's aggressive disregard for road safety harder than in this epic chase in Uncharted 4. 
This is the bit when the bad guys of Shoreline catch up to Nate and Sully in Madagascar, setting the wheels in motion for an epic downhill race under fire in which, thankfully, not a single innocent bystander doesn't manage to leap out of the way. There is enjoyably one particular Shoreline truck with a driver you never see that stalks you relentlessly through the entire set piece. God damn it! You gotta shake that truck! Working on it! Like Stephen King's evil possessed car Christine if she had a mounted machine gun. Which, you missed a trick, Steve. The driving is forgiving enough to keep you speeding towards your objective without time to reflect on the massive property damage left in your wake, and throws in a little 4x4 all terrain action to mix it up. All right, let's see that truck get past that. From there, Uncharted doubles down on the ludicrous multi-vehicle chase when your car chase intersects with that of Nate's big bro Sam. So you can segue from Jeep chase to grappling rope chase, and then on to a mobile gunfight, and then back to a Jeep chase, before being lightly T-boned by the evil-possessed shoreline truck that hates your guts. From there, Uncharted 4 triples down on the ludicrous multi-vehicle chase by popping you on the back of Sam's motorbike. <laughs> Granted, you're no longer driving, but otherwise how would you look back and shoot the angry truck while racing towards the camera in iconic Naughty Dog fashion? I hate this truck! The chase ends as it must, with your truck nemesis eating it in an explosive burnout-worthy takedown. <laughs> I'm gonna need to lie down. That was enough car wrecks for like 20 or 30 games. No wonder there weren't any left for F1. It's a wonder Hyrule ever gets saved with the amount of dicking around that the various links do instead of actually focusing on the task at hand. Hey, it's been a hundred years, I'm pretty sure Princess Zelda can hold on for a few rounds of Boom Bam Golf. But as fun as toying with the fate of an entire world so you can play golf undoubtedly is, we're here to talk about vehicle sections, and one of the most enjoyable ones in recent memory was the shield surfing in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The primary function of your shield in Breath of the Wild is to protect you from swords, arrows, and occasionally floating octopuses disguised as shrubs. <laughs> If you jump while holding a shield, however, then press the button Nintendo insists is A while in the air, Link will land on his upturned shield and ride it like the world's most reinforced snowboard. You can do this anywhere you like, but for the best routes and the most competitive setup, you're going to want to head to Selmy's Spot, a purpose built shield surfing track run by a former pro who can show you the ropes and savagely deride your worth as a shield surfer and by extension human being. Despite the roasting, you'll want to stick around because it turns out shield surfing is brilliant fun. Combining the speedy downhill racing of a snowboarding game with Breath of the Wild's excellent paraglider makes for a great combination as you ramp off things and then sail effortlessly over obstacles, occasionally busting out tricks because we're the hero of time, dammit, who's gonna stop us? You can also win shields by setting good times on the advanced course, and there are all kinds of tricks and shortcuts for shaving seconds off your time, which you're going to want to do obsessively over and over again. Unless that's just me. Anyway, it's great, and the only way it could be better is if you were being towed by some kind of large, humorous animal. Wait, hang on, I'm hearing that Breath of the Wild has that as well. Alright, pack it up, driving games, you're done. It's Zelda now. Zelda is driving games from now on. Yo, Mark, I need you to come tomorrow at 9 a.m., okay? Yeah, sure. There's something we gotta do before work. Before work? Really? Yeah, man. You'll see when you get here. Oh, and don't be late. Although Shenmue, in theory, is a thrilling martial arts story about a young man's quest for revenge, much of the actual gameplay involves you having to get various part-time jobs because you spent all your money on capsule toys. Hey, what's this? One such job that you, as Ryo Hazuki, can get is as a forklift operator, in which you have to use a forklift to move crates from one part of the harbour to another, and it is exactly as exciting as it sounds. 
The good news for you though is that your new colleagues have a somewhat lax approach to forklift safety, in that they start every day on the job by warming up with a full-on race of these small cars with giant pointy knives sticking out of the front. Time for a daily warm-up race. You all do your best now. Yeah! yeah. It's worth pointing out here that the forklift job in Shenmue isn't optional. It's part of the main story and you need to work there for five full days to advance the plot. Getting up early, travelling to work, putting in a day moving crates and then heading home to sleep. The forklift races serve as both a fun diversion to start your day off during this routine and also as a way of making you feel closer to your colleagues as you talk about the races and make predictions for tomorrow. Mark. Hey. Dio. Yeah. How you like and work? It's okay, I suppose. And when the rest of your day is spent moving boxes around a warehouse, it's almost supernaturally thrilling to be doing anything that isn't that. The actual racing itself is pretty straightforward, but that doesn't mean there isn't skill involved, particularly in the corners and deciding when the right moment is to attempt to overtake. It's extremely challenging, and guaranteed, nothing in Shenmue will give you a greater sense of triumph than placing first in a forklift race. Not even revenge on your father's killer. Finish! Forklift racing is still fondly remembered by fans, and it's not for nothing that the forklift has become a symbol of the Shenmue series. Ryo and his forklift even proved so popular that they were actually released as DLC for Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, events which I think we have to assume canonically are happening on Ryo's lunch break. I won. All right, back to the warehouse with you, Ryo. Those capsule toys aren't going to buy themselves. Super Mario Odyssey, in which Mario hijacks people's brains with a magic hat, don't think too hard about it, is full of fun minigames, and also that one where you have to walk in a line. It really feels like more of a Luigi thing. Most of the minigames use the same skills you'll be employing in the main game, namely running, jumping, and mind-jacking terrified sentient beings with your cursed headwear. Some of these minigames do involve vehicles, like the scooter sections in New Donk City, but none of them are as lovingly put together or as fun to play as the Bound Bowl Grand Prix located in the wintry Snow Kingdom. Bound Bowl Racing is a custom of the local Shiverian people, a rotund walrus-like folk who race by curling into a ball and bouncing their way down a banked snowy racetrack. Of course, Mario can't enter the race in his useless human form. Luckily, he has a nightmare hat that lets him mind-jack one of the Shiverians, whose possessed body will be the vehicle of this vehicle section. Now you get to experience this sacred Shiverian custom for yourself and take part in the Bound Bowl Grand Prix, a gloriously silly, fun and deceptively challenging race in which you careen along the icy track, smashing into other Shiverians to jockey for position, as well as bounding, a technique whereby you jump as you hit the ground to provide an extra boost of speed and a handy way to cut corners. Though it seems cartoony and simple, Bound Bowl Grand Prix races are surprisingly technical, highly competitive, and the timing and positioning of your bounds is crucial if you're to keep your speed up through corners and take the shortcuts you'll need to win the later, harder races. Plus, you're not even in a dumb car. You're just a roly-poly walrus person out there doing their best. It's totally heartwarming. If you forget the bit where we stole this guy's body 20 minutes ago. This thing is falling apart. It'll hold. Purpose, didn't you? Depending on who you ask, the Warthog vehicle from the original Halo Combat Evolved is either a franchise defining pillar of the Halo experience or a crime against driving controls. I say, why not both? Okay, Charlie Team, Warthog deployed. Saddle up and give them hell. The fact is, Halo's Warthog is an indispensable generator of memorable Halo moments, and the slippy slidey handling did improve after that first game. 
And regardless of the idiosyncratic driving experience, it is the Warthog that makes the final minutes of the final campaign level of Halo 1 so heart-poundingly unforgettable. We have a Wildcat destabilization of the ship's fusion core. The engines must have sustained more damage than we thought. Analyzing. We have six minutes before the fusion drives detonate. This is the bit when Master Chief must race against the clock to escape the wrecked UNSC Pillar of Autumn before the ship blows up and destroys the Halo, the Covenant fleet, and the entire Flood Venice along with it. It's a cinematic seat of your armoured pants experience in which Master Chief mows down enemies and ramps off the scenery like a boss. Although the frantic time pressure would occasionally make the faithful Warthog vehicle less your ride or die favourite, and more your ride and die favourite. In any case, Halo fans will fondly recall fishtailing the Warthog through explosions while the classic Halo theme rises in the background. This celebrated vehicle section culminates in Master Chief's last second escape aboard a longsword, outrunning the explosion that engulfs the Halo and saves all the sentient life in the galaxy, which all in a day's work for a mighty space hero. Halo, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started. Uh, but seriously, Cortana, can you do something about that warthog handling before the next game? Like, hack the firmware or something? Say what you like about the Call of Duty series, there's no denying they do big budget spectacle incredibly well, which is good news if you like explosions, and bad news if you're the Eiffel Tower. The series is arguably at its most impressively cinematic in Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, whose name, we assume, is a reference to the vast infinity of space, rather than the fact that, at this point, the Call of Duty series has been going on for f***ing ever. We have no precedent for this, we have no playbook for this, and apparently we have little time. Infinite Warfare catapults the series' eternal conflicts into the farthest future yet, which means A, robots, B, Jon Snow in space, and C, you getting the keys to your very own spaceship. It turns out that while running, shooting, sliding, and shooting is pretty much the same throughout most eras of human history, piloting a cool starfighter is totally badass and we want to do it as much as possible, please. It's that Call of Duty presentation that really sells it though, from the takeoff process that sees you seamlessly get into your ship from the site of a ground battle you were just in, before barreling skywards out of the Earth's atmosphere. into the eerie silence of space, where the only sound you can hear is the ominous creaking of your ship that we're suddenly aware is the only thing standing between us and the infinite uncaring vacuum of space. This is Call of Duty, so you know you're going to be shooting things, but luckily it turns out it's basically impossible to have a space dogfight and not be grinning ear to ear the entire time. Yes, you're basically locking onto baddies and holding shoot until they explode, but damn it if this isn't the most fun I've had in a Call of Duty game for years. Could have done with some of this in Call of Duty Modern Warfare. I don't know, a Captain Price dream sequence or something. Alien invasion subplot? Look, I'm just an ideas man, Infinity Ward. I will need producer credit though. There you go friends, those were seven vehicle sections in non-driving games that were better than frankly they had any right to be. If you're looking for another video in a similar vein, can I recommend you this one? From outside Xbox, should be on screen right now. And for something completely different, why not check out this video from Luke and Ellen over on Outside Extra. It should also be on screen somewhere right now. Enjoy!